Becoming the Man, Chapter 11, Darius Curtis and the Training of the New Man. It was many years ago Mr. White was trained to be the man, and a lot had changed in the world since then. Twelve weeks had passed since the brutal assault of Paul Roberts, and Mr. White met the young black man for the first time. Mr. White was very impressed by Paul, but he questioned his motive for wanting the job. It seemed very personal, and Paul Roberts made no attempt to hide it. Mr. White would train him with a technique that Mr. Giles had labeled the one-on-one -on -one many decades ago after the Martin Luther King situation. It was when you randomly selected a name from Rusty's database and influenced the direction of a person's life to demonstrate the different ways the system operated. Meanwhile, the person on the other end was having their very life tampered with from behind the shadows unknowingly. It was a cruel but necessary way to train a new recruit. It also ensured that the overall balance of things would not be affected while an old man was transitioning in a new man. After a few days of intense training, Mr. White and Mr. Roberts typed in the code that would generate them a random name and life to be blanketed with their influence. It was Darius Curtis. Darius lived in the metro area and that was just by chance. Any black man or woman from any city could have been generated, but against all odds, they had selected a local. Mr. White almost regenerated a new name, but felt no need to complicate things. He already had to delay his retirement 12 weeks while trying unsuccessfully to persuade the higher-ups to simply choose the next applicant. He had no idea they already invested a million dollars into Paul Roberts on a whim, a million dollars that was never recovered or found, just like the last two suspects in Paul's parking lot assault. Mr. White and Paul Roberts sat side by side as every intimate detail of Darius Curtis's life appeared on the screen. Anything the man did that ever reached a computer was all there. It was extensive. Had not Paul Roberts' horrific experience taken the fear of all things out of his hardened heart, he would have probably been scared. Mr. White explained to Paul, This is what we call the one-on-one. -on -one. I'm going to basically show you what this job is all about via this man, Darius Curtis. As you can see, it seems he's underemployed. Looks like he completed community college, but has an inability to find jobs outside of retail and manual labor. It seems that he regularly goes to job interviews and even attends seminars related to his desired profession, the banking industry. It also looks like he's looking for something entry level with the hopes of moving up. He should be easy to influence as all of the self-destruction tools are very near to his place of residence. I believe we can push him in that direction very easily. It might just take a few weeks, but in that time, you will learn just how far our reach is. It seems he has a job interview today, which is good. We won't have to waste much more time. Are you following me, Paul? Paul responded attentively. Of course. Show me how it works. Darius showed up to the job interview early. He had been to a dozen before this one with no luck as of yet. He worked as a picker at a factory that shipped out goods from an online retailer, but he needed something better to pay back a high-interest loan he took out. Living with his mother and sister in a two-bedroom apartment only left room for him to sleep on a fold-out couch in the living room every night. He wasted a few years after high school when taking one year off turned into three years of menial work before deciding to return to community college for a two-year degree. He was an easygoing guy and took things in stride, even when times were tough. The receptionist called his name as he waited in the lobby and she led him down the hall to a man named Mr. Shipman's office. He sat down and began the process of another cookie cutter job interview where the interviewer asked about his strengths, weaknesses, and his education. Darius had a great way with words and articulated his thoughts smoothly. He put the listener at ease. Mr. Shipman was very impressed and sure that Darius could handle the entry-level bank job. He had the authority to hire him on the spot, and that was just about to happen when Mr. Shipman's phone rang. Uh, excuse me for a second, sir, said Mr. Shipman as he reached for the phone. He then said, yes, filled, but well, then why? I understand, I understand, yes, sir, if you insist, yes, sir. He hung up the phone, removed his glasses, took a deep breath, and apologized. Sorry, Darius, it seems that the job has been filled. That was corporate on the phone. We'll keep your application on file, and if anything opens, you will be the first one I call. I feel you are more than qualified. It just seems corporate has filled the position. 
Darius, keeping true to his easygoing nature, replied, Well, thank you for your time, sir. Please keep me in mind if anything should open up. And just as quick as he had been ushered in by the receptionist, he found himself heading out of the office and walking towards the bus stop in a light rain. Darius would have got the job. Mr. White and Paul Roberts were able to make a phone call to a contact who called their contact, leading all the way down to the bank managers who made the call to Mr. Shipman, urging him to deny Darius the job. For the next three weeks, Darius's debit card would be declined, denying him access to his money. He was harassed by police in two separate cases of mistaken identity, and when he decided to apply to a four-year university, for some reason, his school transcripts had been wiped from the school's database and he was charged a fee to retrieve them, which he couldn't pay due to the jam-up with his debit card. His happy-go-lucky attitude deteriorated into an around-the-clock annoyance, coupled with a short fuse. It felt like more than bad luck. It felt like more than a test from God. It was as if there was a dark cloud over his life, raining misfortune, and he was caught in a flood of it. He complained to fellow bus passengers about it, but realized he just sounded like another bitter, angry black man. He tried to talk to his mother about it, but she came from an era where African Americans were sprayed with fire hoses, so she felt as though he had it easy. After the three weeks of disappointment, just like Mr. White had planned, Darius never showed up for his job interview at a temp agency. He stopped at the bar at the end of his street and sat down on the stool, even though it was only 12 noon. He would stay seated on the same stool until 5 p.m. when just by chance he would engage in a conversation with someone who actually felt his plight.